Um, let us have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we are once again privileged to just go through your word. And we are looking for some precious gems that can help us to understand you better. We know for this life, it's going to be extremely difficult to really get to a good understanding of God. We still need to get to the depths of God in the life to come. And that is going to be an eternity. If the Bible has so much in it that is so profound, then we don't know when we should still speak about God. But nevertheless, we are here tonight in all humility so that you can shine that light from heaven and that the Holy Spirit can endow us with that knowledge and understanding to know who you really are. Father, in terms of the Holy Spirit, we realize that the Holy Spirit's always been in the shadow, in the background of our understanding, but there's more to the Holy Spirit than what we think. And we can find these very facts in your word. Will you please reveal unto each one of us who you really are? And Lord, we have a few other speakers for tomorrow. Will your spirit guide them in their thoughts as they will also present the Holy Spirit in salvation and the Holy Spirit in terms of the pioneers and how they understood him. Give us your understanding here tonight as we deal with the Bible and the facts of the Bible that we'll be able to get the crystallized thought and that we can share it with those who have no knowledge of you. We also know that there is another Pentecost coming and we haven't experienced the first one but we know the second one is going to be extremely powerful. Please prepare our hearts for it, Father. Prepare our souls. And may we prepare our families, the church, and may we also prepare the world at large. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I first would like to read from the Word of God. Good evening to all of you. I have some friends who also came from afar. My uh, the Ramages brothers, they always supported me so well. They're always supportive in the church. And I suppose we have, there are so many others that I'd like to, you know, just highlight by name. I'll have to do it with each and every one of you, should I do it. But please, welcome and thank you for coming. And may this be a profitable study tonight on the Holy Spirit. God bless you all. 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17, all scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Now here's a, a powerful uh, verse of scripture that every scripture is God-breathed. And that's what the Greek says. Just four words. Every scripture is God-breathed. All scripture inspired by God. Profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. Then we have another one. Another precious verse of scripture. And this one comes from the book of Peter, 2 Peter 1, 21. It says, for no prophecy ever made by an act of human will 
but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. So these men were moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. Now, if these men were moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God, these are the very men that we read about in the Bible. These are the prophets that we read about. And if it's the Holy Spirit behind all this, then he's the author of Scripture. Isn't it so? And if he's the author of Scripture, and we call the Bible the Word of God, then the Holy Spirit is God. Our discussion is over. Nevertheless, I'll go through a few points. I do not know if uh, my friend, Pastor Alexander, is here. He's probably still traveling. Uh, the two of us were going to be in discussion tonight. He's right here. He's right here. Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, apologies for being a little bit late. Um, Elohim. So, so, who is Elohim? And, you know, as I understand it, Elohim is taken from the word El, is that right? El, which means first, which means all-powerful. But Elohim, what does that, what does that mean? Elohim. We read about Elohim in the first book of the Bible. First verse, first chapter, first book. And we have a number of students here who can just give us, enunciate the words in Hebrew. And it basically says, in beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And our problem here is that the Bible was not originally written in English. So this is where we have difficulties at time, where we cannot find the exact answer or clarity to the verse. But there's more to it when we read it in the Hebrew. And we're not saying that all of you must study Hebrew now or Greek, uh, but I think certain books and certain Bibles are being prepared for this particular reason, so that it, we, it would really clarify it. Elohim appears right there in Genesis 1, Bereshit bara Elohim. And that Elohim comes out in the plural form. And this is what the English does not say, it doesn't state it. In the beginning, God created. Now we need to know more about God, who is God? But now if it says, in the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. We know the ending, the im at the end, brings it to plurality. Because Elohim, the singular form of Elohim is Eloah. Or in the Aramaic, we have Elah. And Elah is very similar, if not exactly the same word in the Arabic, which is Allah. The singular form we so, have discussed. So Elohim is, a, is the plural form. The plural form. Uh, what does that, what does it mean? What does plural mean? The plural form, we as Christians would easily dive in and say that plural form is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And I think you are right. But it would be difficult to just say that to anyone without the proof from the scriptures. We need to say, all right, here it states, it is the Father, it is the Son, it is the Holy Spirit. But we know from there, at least we can pick up that it is in the plural form, and it will then go further down in the chapter, uh, Genesis 1, 26, and God's, um, God said, let us make man in our image. There's the plural form given. 
after our likeness. And from there we can then see it is definitely more than one. It is not one singular person. There's more to it as we read uh, the Bible starting from Genesis 1 and going further on. But there are more scriptures to that. We have others, let us go down, we, we read in uh, chapter 11. There's also one in Genesis 3.22. And perhaps I might as well read that one to you. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 22. And in Genesis 3, 22, we read the following. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. And now he might stretch out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. There it is, we find it in the plural form, but it does not say that it is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The revelation only comes out in the New Testament. Hmm. Hmm. So, would, would, would it be... Father, Son, Holy Spirit, so where does modalism feature? Man, I think that question should be directed to um, Dr. Platts. He, he deals with modalism. <laughs> we have modalism. We have perichoresis. We have sabellianism. And these terms when you deal with them in theology, Dr. Platts would explain to you, when you deal with them, you begin to see the triune God in a different light. They say, but is this really God? And some of the definitions are so awkward that you would see God as a dragon. So it is not, uh, the, the arguments came already from very early, probably the fourth century, where they were already debating Father, Son, and Holy, Holy Spirit. And some of it, modalism, sabellianism, they would explain that God is, should be seen in light of these, God is just behind these masks. The reality of God should be come out. Or they would see one substance, and they would see three persons. And then again, it sounds like a dragon. But this is not really what we believe in terms of the triune God. Modalism, sabellianism, perichoresis, and so on, uh, we will not, at this stage, put in the minds of our people. So we're dealing with, with, with the Old Testament here. Um, yes, we're dealing with the Old Testament. And another understanding, if you may, another understanding of the name Elohim, some scholars would uh, also mention that it's a plural of majesty. And that plural of majesty um, is interpreted with the understanding that God can be used in a verse or a passage of scripture as the plural God, but he's identified as a single member of the Trinity. And also that the verb in the masculine, the man, uh, the verb is masculine, it is also singular in form. Now you have the noun Elohim as plural, but the verb is singular. Now that doesn't really work well with Hebrew. There must be agreement. And with this, you got to now begin to understand the background to it. And that, hence you have Israel with its monotheistic God. But in terms of the masculine singular and the plural God, the problem is we have to look for something more than that. There is a presiding member behind it. And these three had to decide somehow in our human understanding that one of the three will be the presider. And having a presiding member, there will be the singular pronoun form where he appears. And that's why in verse uh, Genesis 1, I think I might as, re uh, might as well read this to you. In Genesis 1, 26, 
we find that we found these words then God said let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky over the cattle of all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth God created man in it doesn't say their image he created man in his image and this is where this singular comes in this is where the presiding member comes in one of them had to preside and say all right I will take the the role as representative but that does not deny the fact that there is at least more than one of them so if if Elohim is plural uh, then and there's more than one of them then what does that say for the essence in terms of their what they made of yes man it's so difficult to say what God is made of <laughs> but we can suspect we can try and find some answers in the Bible we find these answers also in theology that they are of the same substance and this is word substance we also supply with the word essence they are of the same essence and being of the same essence you have the father the son and the holy spirit and these three being of the same essence they are yet or still three separate persons but of the same substance so the word that comes to us is the word homo usios. Homo is one, usios is the substance. They are of the same essence. But if I say to you homo usios, it means they are of similar essence, which they are not. I and my father are one, Jesus said. So, so God, does God, is that Elohim is that the name that God has given to himself or man that is a very good question I thought about it this week that these terms that we have these names these titles to can we really with certainty say that these are the ones that belong to God isn't it true that perhaps when we get to heaven we might find I'm just giving an example that um, the father's name is John and Jesus is Mark and the Holy Spirit is um, give me a lovely name Colin <laughs> all right I hear Stephen there so celestial names I would think it could be what we have in the Bible we have father son Holy Spirit these sound more like titles and these titles bring about as you read them, as you understand, you begin to see that they bring about a relationship. And this relationship, to my understanding, is more familial. There's a family relationship here. This family relationship, I understand that if the one is the father, the other one is the son, the other one is the Holy Spirit, that if the one is God the Father, the other one is God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. There should be some relationship. How Jesus called out a number of times, my Father. He would say, I will call on my Father. And he can, you know, he can supply um, all these soldiers. I think uh, probably what the number that I've heard was about 72,000. So God, he shows this dependence on his father. But the father shows his dependence and he calls him my son. So now if there's a father-son relationship and the Holy Spirit is another one. And we will get into that further. But I would say that um, we are understanding God still from a human point of view. The divine sparks are given to us. But we still see him or see the three in human understanding. Uh, and many times we use the, um, the word, theological word, anthropomorphic. Anthropomorphisms. And these come out quite strong in the Bible. Yes. 
you can carry on. Again, on the plural of majesty uh, for Jehovah, divine name of all three. Now here I'm saying that Jehovah is a name. Now that's not a title. Jehovah is a divine name. And I don't know, perhaps I'm doing the wrong thing by uttering out this name, pronouncing this name. The Hebrews were very careful when they read the Hebrew Bible. Every time they come to the tetragrammaton, those four consonants, they wouldn't read that name. They would just pronounce Adonai. Adonai means Lord. Adonai means master. But they were very, very careful. They would not, they, you know, how they tread. They realize God is holy and that his name is holy. His people also holy. And we have to actually respect his name. I agree with the Jehovah's Witnesses. That, that name is sacred. I know that's the only doctrine that they have. Because when they come to you, they only speak about do you know the name is Jehovah? Do you know that's a sacred name? I said, I agree with you. And I wish we can perhaps respect his name more. But that name, I believe, is applicable to the Father. It is applicable to the Son. It is applicable to the Holy Spirit. When you say Jehovah, you are referring to all three. Or when you refer to one particular one, you have to then refer to the function that is, being that is being performed. Here it says, he, singular form, representing the majesty and the excellence mm. of all three, is the God of gods, and he is also the Lord of lords. That had to do with the uh, plurality of majesty. Yes, Arnold. Uh, this, this is actually not in the script. No. But when the Bible says, let us make man in our image, and God said, or then God said, then Elohim said, what does, it, what does that imply for us if we consider the description that you've given, excellence, all-powerful, creator God? Uh, what does that mean for us? How, how does that relate to the image of God for humans? I think for humans, we, there it says, and God said, let us make man in our image. Well, we understand the word man there. Um, I don't really like to use that and tell women that they are included in that. Um, I like the idea humankind yeah. uh, rather than mankind. Um, it's all-inclusive, uh, man, no. But where God created man, he said, let us make man in our own image. First of all, uh, this is also very grammatical when we say, let us make man in our image. Uh, the let us comes in the cohortative form. It's cohortative. Uh, here we have something also very similar to a command. If it had to be a command, then God is commanding himself. But the three of them are in discussion. Let us make man in our image. So it's a, it, it partly a command, but also partly a request. Let us make man in our image, similar to when God created the light and all that, and he said, let there be light. More like a command request. Um, but in terms of Making man in his image, we understand that to be the moral image of God. Am I right, Dr. Platts? When you say, let us make man in our image, the moral image of man. Well, we'll still discuss this. Um, we seem to have the form of God. We seem to, we have the sin that we bear. We understand our looks, what I look today, uh, what I look like today is, is more uh, the problem of sin in the bloodline. And I don't know if that is a good excuse. Um, but we, I know that I have been formed in the image of God. So when we, made, we are then made in the image of God, and he, in Genesis 1, he already said he made them male 
and female. So we are assured already that this was God's plan. It was not a matter of, oh man, I see he's walking alone. We got to understand those scriptures. God can never be fooled. God can never be tricked. God can never, you know, no one can say to him, what are you doing? He's God. And if he knows the end from the beginning, he knew he was going to create the woman as well. So this was in his plan. Therefore, God created man. He created the woman. And that was the crown of his creation. Just something I'd like to say further, that when he created man and woman, from some ancient manuscripts, the Syriac manuscripts, it says that he created the woman to be man's equal. Let's close the word there. So how can, how can they be one? The oneness of God, um, I begin here with this statement, or rather this word, echad. Now, echad is the Hebrew word that really means one. Um, we take this from the book of Deuteronomy, and I would like to read it to you. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6, and we read verse 4. Uh, hear, O Israel, and that word hear is also the word obey, two words that have the same Hebrew word. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And if we read it in the Hebrew, it says, Hear, O Israel, Jehovah, our Elohim, Mm. is one Jehovah. Can you perceive that? Jehovah, our plural God, is one Jehovah. From there, I conclude that Jehovah the Father, Jehovah the Son, Jehovah the Holy Spirit, is one Jehovah. They are one. And here we have the word one. And you know, sometimes we just go around this word and we try to explain it. Well, they are one in love, which is true. One in character. One in decision making. One in the plan of salvation. How they will save humankind. They are one in understanding. There's a word I picked up there, penetrating. I don't really like it in theology. There's a mutual penetration here with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, but it relates to their intention and their thought and how they understand each other. Now, there's understanding. They are one. Jesus said it. I and my Father are one. If you've seen my character, you've seen the character of my Father. Likewise, if you've seen the character of Jesus, you will certainly see the character of the Holy Spirit. You will see me for a while and then you won't see me. And then you'll see me again. Him and the Holy Spirit, they have much in common also in their looks, also in their personality. I think we need a greater understanding of the Holy Spirit. On this one, Pastor Alexander, we use this word, echad, also, when we refer to, to marriage, um, I might have recorded that one, but the three of them are one, and here Jesus says, I and the Father, we are echad. We are one, yet they are two. You understand what I'm saying? Two persons, and they say they are one. That agreement, that sense of understanding, their responsibility of saving hum humanity all relates to one. Furthermore, the two shall become one flesh when husband and wife get married. That's why I look exactly like my wife. Uh, <laughs> the two shall become one flesh. They are still two, yet they are one. They begin to grasp the way the one works and the way the other one operates. Two differences but they seem to get that agreement based on their understanding they grow. The one knows you don't like that, okay, I'll try and satisfy you by doing it the way you like it, and vice versa as well. So we have the same word, echad, where the two become one flesh. Therefore, we can with confidence say that 
the three, that they are one, also based on these scriptures. The two who come become one, they also two, but they are one. So one is the word that we just need to understand here. Once again, echad is used. That is what we mean by one. So the, the, the divine name of Jehovah applies to all three, but you haven't really uh, spoken about the, the Holy Spirit much. Yes. You've spoken about the Father and the Son. So, so where do we encounter uh, the Holy Spirit in, in the Old Testament? Yes, the, I hope I can give you those references. We should really go to the book of Isaiah. Uh, there are, first of all, there are references, three that I have picked up as three major ones uh, in terms of the Holy Spirit. Um, where the Holy Spirit is referred to, as I said, is also referred to as Lord. Now, I'm just going to read this before I go further on to that question. The divine name was not pronounced, we said, God is holy, His name is holy. And the next point, the name Jehovah is applied to the Father, to the Son, and to the Spirit. Now, if we look at Luke 1, verse 67 and 68, we will discover the Holy Spirit comes out there. And what does it say about him? Luke 1, verse 67 and 68. And his father Zacharias was filled with the Holy Spirit. And he prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited us and accomplished redemption for his people. So he's saying it's the Holy Spirit, but then he goes further in 68, and he says he's the Lord God. The Holy Spirit is the Lord God. If He is the Lord God, the Holy Spirit is, number one, Jehovah, Lord. Number two, He is Elohim. He is one of the members of the Elohim family. Now, we've got to, I think we've got to understand that you're dealing with the Jehovah family, the Elohim family. That is what it is. That you're dealing with a family unit and that there is a close connection when it comes to the Holy Spirit, remember you had the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Jesus depended on His Father. So His Father is His, so to speak, celestial Father. That's from heaven. But when He comes to the earth, He seems to have had another Father because Mary was found to be with child of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit was then his father on earth. Doesn't make sense? But remember, this is all in the plan. This is in the plan. This is the immaculate conception. Where you now have God the Father in heaven and you have the Holy Spirit here on earth. These three texts, Luke 1, 67, Isaiah 61, Isaiah, the, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. To do what? For he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor, heal the brokenhearted, set the captives free, etc., etc. At times the divine name is with reference to one single member, but at times it would be to all three. The Spirit of the Lord means the Spirit of the Father, the Spirit of the Son, and one that also sounds strange, the Spirit of the Holy Spirit. Why, why can't He have a Spirit too? Is He a person? If He's a person, then He must also then have a Spirit. Why would we exclude him? I'd like to know from the King's Heralds why they sing, I'm going to meet God the Father, yes, and God the Son. Well, 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 well. Where's God the Holy Spirit? <laughs> <laughs> the Holy Spirit is both a being and a person. Person means having a bodily form or an appearance. We go further down. Being, according to Webster's Dictionary, means one who lives, one who exists, or assumed to do, 
or sorry, or assumed to do so, a human or a divine being. Some church believers lately do not accept that the Holy Spirit is a being. That means he does not live, nor does he exist. He's a being. Now, the argument, I'm sorry, if there's any anti-Trinitarians here, I don't want to step on your toes. But this is the, the latest argument that they come up with, that you have the Father as a being, the Son as a being, but the Holy Spirit is not a being. Why not? What's the meaning of being? Can they clarify that to me? If he's not a being, then he does not live and he does not exist. But then the Holy Spirit emanates from God and from Jesus. Fair question. <clears throat> but I think that is, that is the other crux of the point, of the, the issue that needs to be dealt with. He emanates from the Father and he emanate, emanates also from the Son. I think those terms, we, we cannot, we, 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 we have to understand what is meant by it. We have the terms there that God sent his Son. We also have the one that God sent the Holy Spirit. We have these in Galatians, we will see it as we go further down, but they are sent but now if we say that they emanate from it, then we begin to, to, we, we, we begin to bring out terminology that should be understood in its expressive language. Likewise, we have the term that the Holy Spirit is being poured out. Poured out. You pour water or you pour wine. Can you pour out the Holy Spirit? Doesn't make sense. That is anthropopathia. That's a figure of speech. Anthropos is man. Pathos, that feeling that you have. It's a feeling. And this is something that is ascribed to God. So these descriptions as figures of speech they come out and it puts the Holy Spirit in a light that he's not really real because he emanates from the Father and he emanates from the Son. The expressive language there makes it very difficult, but we have put it down and try our best in order to describe it and in terms of our research. I'd like to just go further on that the same way, um, and this is where you can help us too. You know, we, we're not alone in the, we are all Seventh-day Adventists and we need to find these answers. One is that uh, Jesus said, and uh, we, we've spoken about it to, to our students, Jesus said to his disciples, he spoke to his disciples, and then he said, receive he the Holy Spirit. But now somehow I've read a statement, I don't know why it says, he breathed on them, the Holy Spirit. Oh, that is very difficult for me to understand. What I do understand from the Bible, that he said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. And when he said it to them, he said it with the understanding that from that time, within 10 days, they will receive the Holy Spirit at Pentecost which they did. They received the Holy Spirit and that he was not given to them at that very moment. Unfortunately, I'm not going to fight with my sister White, my prophetess, that I highly regard. I need to understand what she meant by that. Perhaps if I'm saved one day, she'll be able to explain or take me to God and explain it to me. But as far as the scripture is concerned, there's a tense here known as the aorist tense. And that aorist tense is undefined. And that undefined tense, which is a past tense with characteristics into the present and the future, Jesus said, 
receive he the Holy Spirit, and within 10 days they have received the Holy Spirit, of which some did not go to Pentecost. But that we will still discuss further. So, um, there is a belief which you've explained that, that the Holy Spirit does not emanate from God. Yes. It is, uh, the Holy Spirit is also Jehovah. Holy Spirit is Jehovah. Now, I wonder would it, whether it would be appropriate to, to talk about, uh, or will it be dealt with at another stage, this, this concept that Jesus in eternity also emanates from God. Right. This is again, I have to depend on the writings of our prophetess. Um, some things we, you know, this topic is purely on the Bible. But Ellen G. White says Jesus has within him life that is unborrowed, underived, original. Which means that life of his does not emanate from the Father or from the Holy Spirit. He has life within him, within himself. And he had proven that when he spoken to the Jews of his time in the book of John chapter 2. And what did he say to them? Destroy this body. And within three days, I will raise it to life. However, we do realize that all three played their part in raising him at this resurrection. And as we said, from this resurrection and not this resuscitation. Mm. So, so this concept of, of a, the, a time where Jesus did not, or, or the Son, God the Son did not exist. Um, where, where, where does that thinking come from? I think it comes from the, the terminology begotten. Uh, uh, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. And they have probably developed this into some concept that he had to be begotten from the Father and that he was then a created being. And unfortunately, some of uh, our religious friends from other denominations, they would then quote Proverbs chapter 8. I think it is 22. Uh, perhaps I should just confirm that. Uh, they use Proverbs chapter 8 and verse 22, that the Lord possessed me at the beginning of his way, before his works of old. The Lord possessed me. And when they read the context, they will see the context relates to wisdom and not to Jesus Christ. He possessed me. And by the way, wisdom is the Hebrew word chokhmah which is in the feminine form, Jesus was not female. So they use that begotten. But when you go to John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. The word begotten need not be there. It can be removed. In fact, I've asked the translators um, from the Lockman Foundation Please, can you do us a favor by removing begotten? It's just causing unnecessary difficulty. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son is perfect according to the Greek. And furthermore, our favorite text, uh, or rather perhaps mine, <laughs> is John 1. And I'll read it again. John 1 verse 18 to show that Jesus is very unique. John 1.18 says, no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father. So Jesus is the only begotten God in the bosom of the Father. Now some of your translations would read, he's the only begotten Son. Fine. The translation is welcome. But we're looking here for dates. And the earliest date on this manuscript is from 110 AD. Now that is very early. The only begotten God. 
If Jesus is the only begotten God and the scripture said it then, over a period of time and it had been changed to the only begotten son, those are rather late manuscripts. You will find this reading in the New American Standard Bible. You will also find it in the NIV, New International Version, and probably in the New Revised Standard Version, the ESV, and I think the ESV would have it, and also the Amplified. So God um, has no beginning. He's the Alpha, the Alpha and the Omega. Perhaps more precisely, he's the Aleph and the Tau. Because the Bible was originally written in Hebrew. And can you tell us more about the meaning of the Holy Spirit? The Spirit, well, the, what I have in terms of the word Spirit, it, these are just definitions. But the Spirit in the Bible contains a number of synonymous terms. As other possibilities regarding context, namely character, persona, willpower, nature, disposition, vital spirit, passion, mental or moral nature or qualities, essence, purpose, aim. Our, that is what we have in terms of spirit. We have the word being, we have the word person, we have the word spirit. And these are the terms we need to understand that would go around in understanding the Holy Spirit. But in terms of the Holy Spirit, um, what would you like to know about him? Well, maybe, maybe we should... We should I'm, I'm actually uh, very keen on, on, on references to the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. Oh, yes. You asked me that earlier, and I don't think I directly hit the nail on the head. But references of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament, the, the word or the name Holy Spirit only appears three times in the Old Testament. Most of the other times, it appears as spirit, very shortened form, or the Spirit of God, the Spirit of the Lord, or just spirit. But Holy Spirit appears three times. And out of the three times, not one of the three seem to relate to the Holy Spirit. If you understand what I'm saying. Holy Spirit does not seem to fit into the understanding that in that particular verses you are referring to the person Holy Spirit. Our reasons why the Aramaic uh, ancient manuscripts have it as an understanding that those words is really, they are holy prophets. On two occasions they appear as holy prophets. And that's the ones we find in Isaiah chapter 61. It appears twice there. And then once in David's prayer in um, Psalm 51. And do not take your Holy Spirit away from me. And there where it says the Holy Spirit, uh, the, the scholars of the Old Testament have put it down in lower case. Holy Spirit, not with reference to the Holy Spirit, but the Spirit of God that is holy. Now there I, um, I wouldn't make it as conclusive. I wouldn't say it is final that that is the Holy Spirit, or it is not, I think it calls for more research. But I have looked at the other two, they definitely with reference to the Holy Prophets. Hence, the term is very laconic in the Old Testament. But, his name appears under different names. The Holy Spirit also in the Old Testament appears a number of times as the spirit of prophecy. It was the spirit of prophecy that entered Joseph. It says Joseph was found to have within him the spirit of prophecy. There we really mean the Holy Spirit. Now that appears probably about 15 times as another name for the Holy Spirit. But spirit, um, Pastor Alexander, spirit, um, we have difficulty with that term 
that it's not always the Holy Spirit being spoken of. Every time we see Spirit, don't fall for it that it's the Holy Spirit. For example, um, the book of Genesis says, My spirit shall not always... What is the word? Strive, Strive with man. It's really my breath shall not always remain with man. For his time is really limited. So in other words, in the context, it is his breath that is with man. And as I said, this, this similar one would be Genesis 2 verse 2. And the Spirit of God was moving on the face of the waters. Really, the breath of God was moving gently over the face of the waters. Because after God created the heavens and the earth, He then breathed and everything came as His creation. He breathed things into existence. Isn't it so? Psalm 33. By the words of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them, by the breath of his mouth. He spoke, it was done. He commanded, it stood fast. He called the angels into existence. Yes, sir. And so the, the, um, you have there a, a, a reference that's, that seems to imply that, that the Holy Spirit is, is, is more important because uh, you have lied to the Holy Spirit. Was, would, would, that, would, that be, would that be correct? Okay, you, you referred to the reference of Acts 5. Yes. All right, in Acts 5, they lied, and Anais and Sapphira, they have lied to the Holy Spirit. And I think it's verse 5, where it says that you have not lied to men, but you have lied to, to God. Now, the, the English doesn't really bring it out that strong. The Hebrew would say, you have not lied to men, but you have lied to Elohim. You've lied to the Father, you've lied to the Son, and you lied to the Holy Spirit. So when you lie to any one of these three, remember you're lying to all three. So here in their case, it is as clear as daylight that when they said that you have lied to the Holy Spirit. You have not lied to men, but to God, that the Holy Spirit is God. Do we need to be more clearer than that? I'm speaking of our dear brethren, the anti-Trinitarians, that the Holy Spirit is God. If you've lied to the Holy Spirit, you have lied to God. It is clear. It says it there in Scripture. Nevertheless, let's go on, brother. Okay, yeah. God the Father had not stooped down to take on human form, neither had a touch with humanity, as did the Holy Spirit. Now, here's another case where, and this is one of the difficult points, where the anti-Trinitarians would then ask you, but then uh, why does the Apostle Paul speak of the Father? When he speaks of the Father, he says God. But then when he uses the others, he says Jesus, and he says the Holy Spirit. But then, in terms of the Father, he refers to him as God. It's obvious that here, it was the Spirit that came down. It was Jesus that came down. And this relates all the more to the idea of the incarnation. And because they had a part to play in the incarnation, the Apostle Paul would use the noun God with reference to the Father, not denying the fact that Jesus is also God, not denying the fact that the Spirit is also God. Here we have another one, Jesus and the Holy Spirit. They operated on earth amongst men and women. And Jesus said, I have to go away now. He's been on the earth, he's, he's performed his work, his ministry is over, and after that, he then told them, there's another paraclete coming, another advocate, another comforter, another mediator. So he, he says, I have to go. If I do not go, the comforter will not come. So the timing of God is at play here. And this is where these two come out, Jesus Christ 
and the Holy Spirit. Jesus Christ to re represent his work as Jesus, the one who came to save. Christ, the anointed one. He's the anointed one who came to save. The Holy Spirit, he's the one who will then represent the Father and the Son everywhere he goes to remind folk of sin, to bring them to an order, to inform them that Jesus Christ died for them on the cross. And that is his work, to lead the sinner to Christ. Now, in the performance of their work, these terms the Apostle Paul used, these terms the other apostles used, hence, they would then still retain the Father under the name God. There were also two events, as you know, on the day of Pentecost. There was the coronation of Christ in heaven, where he was then crowned as prophet, as priest, and as king. While that was taking place, the Holy Spirit was inaugurated on earth. And that's what happened at Pentecost, when these tongues came down as of fire. And that's where they began to speak in physical, literal tongues. Glossolalia. Glosso is the tongue. And laleo means to speak. They were speaking languages. They probably heard Peter speaking Arabic, Bartholomew speaking Egyptian. They said, how, are, how is this possible that these men are speaking in our language? I'm an Egyptian, and here I hear Bartholomew speaking in, in Egyptian. Man, this is crazy. These men are from Galilee. But it is as the Holy Spirit gave them utterance. This mighty work was then performed. And I think you wanted to carry on, Pastor Alexander. No, you could carry on. You can carry on. But yes, here's, here's the question. So, so the, at Pentecost, mm -hmm. Pentecost, or maybe I'm making, making a statement, Pentecost happened because of the coronation. Yes. Firstly, mm -hmm. and the obedience. Secondly, because they were in one accord. Therefore, the Holy Spirit was poured out on them. Yes. But the, the purpose of the Holy Spirit was to, in, as you said, inaugurate the church. And therefore, whenever we look back in history, we see that God does big things at certain epochs. When it came to Abraham, he, and, and, and in Acts, uh, Paul says that, he, that, 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 sorry, Stephen says that the God of glory came to Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia. Must have been a, a, a glorious appearing. And here, uh, in, at Pentecost, it was, it was equally glorious. Must have been. But it, but it, uh, but it was a, for the purpose of inaugurating the church. That's correct. Because remember, the, the, when we speak of the church, you first had the 12 disciples of Christ. But at that time, uh, the Apostle Paul, he found some disciples was it at Ephesus? Book of Acts 19. And this was found to be a very important and prominent piece of reading. May I read it to you? And it happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the upper country and he came to Ephesus. And he found some disciples. He said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said to him, no, we have not even heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And this could be a problem. Where it might be the case that even in our church, people have not heard of the Holy Spirit, which is almost not possible to believe, right? And he said, into what? Then were you baptized? And they said, into John's baptism. Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in him who was coming after him, that is, Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. They were then baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Here you had 12 disciples. They were baptized by John's baptism. 
And you know, it's called, he was known as John the Baptist. So he must have been the one who actually led them into this new form of a baptism by immersion, taking them and putting them under the water. And I would believe that this came from the Essenes, where the Essenes had this practice of these sacred baths. And they would then go for their spiritual cleansing. And as a result, as the men believe that John himself was an Essene. He was the one in the wilderness. These are the people who lived in the wilderness near the Dead Sea and so on. But then with John, he, he was in the wilderness, as the Bible says. But he baptized them. What did he baptize them into? What was it all about? Repentance, confession of sins. But then when he met them at Ephesus, these 12 guys, he asked them, have you received the Holy Spirit? He said, well, we didn't even know there's a Holy Spirit. What are you talking about? Then he says, well, you don't know there's a Holy Spirit? You will have to be baptized again. As I said, it would be difficult to say you have to be re-baptized. It sounds as if John's baptism had no value, but it had value. It was a baptism for repentance, confession of their sins. But here he said, no, you will have to be baptized. And I believe perhaps the church takes the stand if someone has been baptized into this church and never believed in the Holy Spirit or the Father or the Son, that such a person should be re-baptized. Because this is a major doctrine of the church. Remember, all our doctrines depend on this, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We depend on them. And John then baptized them. After he baptized them, laid his hands on them, and then they received the Holy Spirit, and they began speaking in tongues. They had this mm. gift of telling others in other tongues what the Lord had done for them. So, so one could consider this, this development then as, as new light. Certainly, when remember, Paul is a witness. Remember, Jesus had done his work. But Paul is now a witness of what he had seen. But he had another experience where Paul was then trained in the Judean deserts, in the Arabian desert, by God himself. And he received his training there. So he then had this. He must have had a lot to offer them since his experience with Jesus Christ. And when he fell off his high horse, where he was told, to go and into the city, and there it shall be told him what to say. So he must have had a mighty experience, but he was not part of the original 12, yet uh, so powerful a message in the New Testament. So there was growth in understanding uh, for, for those 12 disciples. Yes. Uh, uh, and and there, therefore, they, they were baptized into the Holy Spirit with the Holy Spirit, but are there two baptisms? John's baptism and the baptism that they now received of the Holy Spirit. So how does that relate to baptism today? Well, we have baptism, you know, people do confess their sins. That's all part of it. It's all seen as one. Okay. But remember, we have been informed about the Holy Spirit. These men were not. All right. So tell us more about the hierarchy. Well, the hierarchy, uh, we assume again a presiding member, yet without the idea of a hierarchy as first, second, and third person. I, I find it very difficult to put the Holy Spirit as a third person, or um, to put Jesus as the second person. The Bible speaks of him being at the right hand of the Father, yes. Um, but that doesn't mean he's second. So if he's second, um, you know, second in command, that already forms a f some kind of subordination that is subject to the Father. I do not pick up anywhere in the Old or New Testament that the Father is number one, Jesus is number two, and that the Holy Spirit is number three. I appreciate 
my student's point was very powerful on this point when he said to me, when I said, well, Jesus is at the right hand of the Father. And I want to retain my Adventist theology. He said, well, if he's on the right hand of the Father, that means that the Father is on the left. So I said, I agree with you. We, the way certain things are written, the way certain things are expressed, is perhaps where we have to just look a little deeper and see what that expression means. Hence, I would like to quote the book of Daniel again, that they were chewing the bits of the Jews. And chewing the bits of the Jews to me, I couldn't understand it the first time because I was reading it literally. How these Jews, would, how they were choosing, sorry, chewing the bits of the Jews until I discovered, oh, this is an expression. And it means they were maliciously accusing the Jews. It wasn't something that they were chewing because it sounded like as if they were chewing something. But these expressive points, figures of speech, they come out many times in the Bible. As I said, to pour out the Holy Spirit, that's an expression. Holy Spirit cannot be poured out. He's too powerful for that. So this, this concept that, that, that some people have, that there are three, someone actually said to me, me today, that Adventists believe in th three gods. Three gods would be tritheism. But Trinity is not. That's one God. It's tri-unity of God. Tri where there are three, but there's a unity that they are one. But when you say tritheism, yes, then you go into polytheism where there are many gods and there three can be applicable. But it's not applicable to, to what we believe. No, we believe in the Trinity and the term Trinity uh, might be Catholic, but it is not wrong. Nothing wrong with the term. So, so, so Trinity is, 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 is an acceptable I term? Certainly acceptable. Um, the men here, the other theologians, I am certain they are going to agree with me. I don't have to ask them. <laughs> okay. Trinity is an acceptable term, but uh, Ellen White used, she used terms like the Godhead, she used the three, the heavenly trio, she used another term, the three heavenly dignitaries, oh, lovely terms. Uh, Trinity is not uh, an unacceptable term, it's a sensible term that we can use. Remember, there are a lot more that we get from the Catholics, not only this term. Remember, these are the folk who worked on the Bible. There are so many of them translated the Bible, and we have the blessing of the Bible today of what these men and women have done. We have no translated Bible in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Can you help us with, with, with the distinction between the Holy Ghost and the Holy Spirit? The Holy Ghost is just a term that I think this term was formed, uh, the translators must have had some time and some difficulty in their translation. We still appreciate what they have done. These men having worked on the King James Version, um, I just still wanted to see what, uh, the, what they, how they describe it in John Wycliffe's Bible, but in the King James it speaks of the Holy Ghost. Um, the Holy Ghost uh, makes it a little d awkward for me. I would not be against you if you use it. Um, it's just a little awkward for me to, th because I think in terms of a ghost, and when I think in terms of a ghost, a ghost is very negative to me, and to see him as holy um, is really a contradiction. Um, so these, the scholars, uh, you can read Low and Nida. Low and Nida says they please do not use the term Kodesh. Um, Kodesh, is it Kodesh Ruach? Which is Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit. 
It says, do not apply it to an apparition and do not apply it to a ghost. So they, they highly recommend that we use the term Holy Spirit. So it's a recommendation. Our timekeeper has just indicated that we must, we Round must wrap off. up. Okay. Yes, I'm listening, sir. So what do we take away? What do we take away from, from, from this, this, this presentation today? I think what I'd like you to take away is perhaps these. Let, let me just go back on this. Um, and if, if you would be interested in these Bible references, I encourage you to write them down or we can somehow provide it for you. Uh, in some other electronic way. Um, tomorrow we'll also have a little book for you. Um, but this, please don't stone me for my research. Uh, what you can do is write little notes and you can respond to me and tell me how you feel about it. I am not a pneumatologist, not an expert in the study on the Holy Spirit. Um, but uh, I've, I have great interest in the linguistics and the grammar of it. So if there's anything that you feel you'd like to question or you'd like to recommend, it would be highly appreciated. Uh, we only printed about 100 copies, unfortunately. But I think we can somehow find a way where we can get some more printed. But then. I just want your personal response and what you think and whether you agree or disagree, but uh, the whole idea is to find it in the Bible. I have not gone to the writings of Ellen G. White. I have personally, but not for this study. All the pioneers, there are men who will uh, specialize with that by tomorrow, um, and they will then deal with this. But I'd like to take it here from because I believe some of it, or rather the issues involved, where these men brought up the arguments uh, that the Holy Spirit is not God, um, I find it rather to be the contrary, that the Holy Spirit is God. And here I'd like to give you my best references. The first one is, um, as I said to you earlier, the, every scripture is God-breathed, and we call the Bible the Word of God, because he was the one who inspired the prophets. The second one is Acts 5, 1 to 5, and this is the story of Ananias and Sapphira. The third one is internal references to both Holy Spirit and Lord, or God, or Lord and God. Now these references you find in the Bible, where it has Holy Spirit and it has Lord and God, or Lord or God. And here's one in Luke 1, as I explained to you about Zacharias and the Holy Spirit, uh, that God, the Lord God, had come to visit us with reference to the Holy Spirit. The second one, Acts 5, as I have given you, there is a reference to where it says, you've lied to the Holy Spirit, you have not lied to men, but to Elohim. Third one that I have is Hebrews 10, verse 15 and 16. And then I have the parallel references of the Old Testament and the New Testament, which means you can now go to the New Testament. You read the text in the New Testament and the reference where that text or uh, where that portion, that passage is taken from, you go back to the Old Testament where it had been taken from. And then you join the two and you will see the one from the New Testament says Holy Spirit and the one from the Old Testament would say the Lord God, Elohim, Jehovah and so on. In the case of the one, it says that today you, uh, when you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. But it says the Holy Spirit says that. But when you go to the book of Psalm 95, it says there that the Lord God, and it says the Lord our Elohim. 
says, today when you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. So the Holy Spirit is Jehovah and he is our Elohim. It says further that he is our maker. So we got to now find that in the Old Testament. And the next one is Hebrews 10, 15 and 16. And then the parallel text would be Jeremiah 31, 33. Hebrews 10, 17 and Jeremiah 31, 34. Acts 28, 25 to 28. And Isaiah 6, verse 8 to 12. Hebrews 3, 7 to 11. Paralleled with Psalm 95, 6 to 11. This is repeated. However, this time it is based on the pronouns. Me, my, and so on. So those pronouns will then bring out the truth about the Holy Spirit. 2 Corinthians 3, 17 and 18. Paralleled with Judges 3, verse 10. And just one point here. We must be careful that of these so-called exegetical pronouncements. Some of them hold no water. They sound good. Exodus 3, 6. He said also, I am the God. I'm the God of your father. I'm the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Then Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. God of Abraham, God of Isaac, and God of Jacob. And it's easy to run into rhetoric, easy to run into homiletical presentations, preaching. I'm the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And then you say, well, these three, God, Abraham, that's the father. God of Isaac, that's Jesus. God of Jacob, that's the Holy Spirit. Those are little, they're not too, I think perhaps we should take better caution. Because when you look again now, like I said, the English expresses it that way. But the Hebrew says, he is the Elohim of Abraham. In other words, three for Abraham. The Elohim of Isaac, three. The Elohim of Jacob, three once again. And then you have the last is the Trisagion. Trisagion, which we, we have it in our hymns also. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And then they say, well, holy, that first one to the Father. Holy, the second one to the Son. Holy, the third one to the Spirit. But unfortunately, the earliest manuscripts, the Dead Sea Scrolls, only have two holies. So I don't think it's good for us to, to build on these things. They can excite you, yes, but we want the truth as it is in Jesus. Okay, I so think that's we, about it. So as we it. close, then, then there is sufficient, you are satisfied that there is sufficient biblical proof for a triune God. Certainly. Publicly, the Father is both Lord and God. As in Abraham said, O Lord God, what will you give me? He used both terms. He said, Jehovah, Elohim, what will you give me? Then we go to Genesis, uh, rather, uh, John 20, verse 28, where Thomas expressed it by saying, My Lord and my God. He calls Jesus Lord and God. And then Luke 1, 67, and his father Zacharias was filled with the Holy Spirit. And he prophesied saying, blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited us. So we have references for all three as both Lord and as God. We find these references. And the number three comes up so many times. We have these threes, three, uh, well, they were the ones I gave you in Isaiah is where you have three members being spoken of. In Isaiah 48, I think the other one is Isaiah 61, and there's one in Isaiah 42. 
Those are very rare, but at least there are three to point out three. Every time you see them coming out in threes, and this is also the case with the uh, resurrection of Jesus, that the Holy Spirit was the first one, or rather one of them, the three who raised him from the dead. God the Father was the other one, and the third one was Jesus himself raising himself from the dead.